you folks don't know this, but about every 10 years or so, I get the urge for a new car, even if I don't need one. I'm driving a 12-year-old Toyota Camry right now, soon to be 13. It runs fine, and you know, if I keep changing the oil in it and doing the routine maintenance, it's probably going to last another five to ten years. The practical side of me says, as it always has, drive the car until the wheels fall off, and then you get a new one. That's really the only way you get value out of a car. But as you know, what we need and what we want are often very different things. I don't need a new car, but I want one. And besides, I haven't had a midlife crisis yet. <laughs> Unless I live to be 157, in which case I'm okay. But uh, my uneasiness is made worse because every day I drive down the Central Avenue Strip to and from work. And I pass all those car dealerships. And then my wife is in town this week. You may not have seen her yet, but you can see her after worship. She's here in town, and, and she really needs a new car. And so there's been this car on, I won't tell you which dealership, but it's on the corner of the lot, a bright red Mercedes <laughs> 2023 AMG SL63. It's just right on the corner. It's got a price tag in the window, in the windshield, $350. I'm thinking to myself, that must be the monthly lease payment for as long as you live <laughs> for a car that will go from zero to 60 in 3.5 seconds and has 577 horsepower. I'm thinking to myself, my wife really needs that car. <laughs> So we had time on Friday. We pulled into the lot and uh, got out of our car, and uh, you know, a salesperson was on us like a buzzard on roadkill. I mean, he was right there. And I said, Is that $350 price the, the cost of a monthly lease payment? Because that seems awfully low for a car like that. And he said, No, 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 no. That, I thought he was going to tell me it's the weekly price. He said, No, 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 that's the price of the car. I said, y You mean that's the price of the car spread over the next 20 years of my life to buy this car? He said, No, no, that's the total price of the car. I said, What's wrong with the car? Pointing to this, he said, Oh, it's just not, we just have a hard time selling it. I said, You've got to be kidding me. It doesn't drive. And, oh, it drives fine. It, 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 well, how is it that this beautiful car sitting right out here has a price tag on it with gee, 350 bucks and nobody has bought it? There's got to be some catch. I mean, <laughs> is there no engine in it? I mean, does it have a transmission? Is it made out of cardboard? What's the, what's the problem? There's got to be a catch, and you've got to tell me because I'm a minister. I thought I'd throw that trump card right out there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, there, there is a reason that people don't want to buy this car. You see, the, the car drives fine, but it doesn't take you where you want to go. It takes you where you need to go. So let me get this straight. This car only takes me where I need to go, but it doesn't take me where I want to go? He said, that's right. He said, do you want to buy it? I said, no, thank you. <laughs> I mean, would you folks want a car like that? A car that would take you where you need to go? I don't know. In the text for the morning, we meet a man who Jesus wants to take for a ride to a place that he does not want to go. I read for you just a moment ago, Simon the Pharisee. He invites Jesus to his home for a meal. Now, this is not the first time, and it's not the last time, that Jesus would sit down to eat with Pharisees. Not all the Pharisees were the enemies of Jesus. And even if they were, it would be the ultimate hypocrisy for him to sit down to eat with one kind of sinner, but not to sit down with, to eat with another kind of sinner. For Jesus to eat with tax collectors and sinners on the one hand and refuse table fellowship with Pharisees on the other, that would make him guilty of a reverse sort of prejudice. 
I suspect, don't know this, but I suspect that Luke includes this story because of a comment made. You remember, I always read what's before and what's after a text to get the context. In verse 34, it said, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And I think Luke wants everybody to know that Jesus will sit down, will have fellowship with anybody who desires his company. And it doesn't matter to Jesus if you're the best kind of person or if you're the worst kind of person. This particular meal shows that Jesus has uh, concern for the religious and socially outcast people, but he also has concern for the religious and the righteous people, the good people. Now, during the course of the meal, a person like mentioned in verse 34, in fact, the same word is used, sinner, makes her way to where Jesus is reclining and eating his supper. Now, in the first century, in case you didn't know this, I expect you do, but just in case, uh, people dined reclining on their left side, propped up on their elbow with their feet out behind them, and they'd have a pillow under there sometimes, and then there'd be a mat in front of them, and they would reach forward with the right hand and eat. Now, if you're wondering how a woman gets into the dining room, you have to remember that uh, the dining took place in a common courtyard in homes for those who were well-to-do. It, it wasn't really a very private kind of arrangement, but rather a public one. So this, this woman's entrance doesn't really cause great excitement. People are always popping in and out and could easily have access to this place. It's, it's more like having a picnic in a public park than it is a private dinner at home. And besides, I have a hunch, I don't know this, but I have a hunch that Simon liked to be the kind of fella who rubbed elbows with celebrities. You know, he'd just invite Jesus over, maybe get a selfie with him or something like that. But he, he, it, it's good to be known to entertain these kinds of people. What the woman does next, you all know. She comes behind Jesus at his feet, weeping, and begins to wash his feet with her tears and dry them with her hair. She continues to kiss his feet and anoint him with the ointment that she has brought. All this is very startling because no woman in the first century lets down her hair in public. And the fact that she is touching Jesus' feet may be an allusion to something sexual, if you read the book of Ruth about Ruth and Boaz. In any event, uh, Simon the Pharisee is scandalized, and he thinks to himself, doesn't say it, he thinks, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who's touching him, that she is a sinner. It's exactly at that point that things get really interesting that Jesus does not expel this woman of the city is proof to Simon that Jesus is no prophet. Simon thinks this. He doesn't say it. However, Jesus knows exactly what kind of woman this is, and he even knows Simon's thoughts, which is proof by Simon's own criteria that Jesus is, in fact, a prophet. In fact, he's more than a prophet because he forgives sins, and we all know that only one can forgive sins, and that's God. Simon has made two assumptions. First, he assumes that the woman is a sinner. And second, he assumes that if Jesus were a prophet, he'd, he'd know what sort of woman this was. From this, he draws two assumptions, both of which uh, the, 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 the presumptions are correct, but the, the conclusions he draw are, are, are completely wrong. First, he infers that if Jesus knew what sort of woman who was at touching him, he wouldn't allow it. And second, he infers that since Jesus has done nothing to stop the woman, he's not a prophet. Jesus immediately confirms. He not only knows who this is and what kind of woman she is that's touching him, but also he confirms what kind of man Simon the Pharisee is. Jesus even knows what he's thinking. He hadn't said a word, remember. Simon thinks that Jesus does not know, but in fact, it is Simon who does not know. Simon does not know that nobody is a nobody, that every human being is a creature and object of God's care, that even the most shameful person can be forgiven, that no one is righteous in God's sight, that all stand in need of mercy, of God's mercy and forgiveness. It's not Jesus that does not know. It's that self-righteous Pharisee who is ignorant. In God's eyes, nobody is a nobody. 
In this story, we, we see two very different approaches that religious people can take toward other people, people we think to be lesser people. Simon and Jesus are both religious persons in the presence of a sinful woman. Simon has an understanding of righteousness that causes him to distance himself from her. Jesus understands righteousness as to be moving toward her with forgiveness and a blessing of peace. The term, of course, common to both those things is distance. One kind of righteousness keeps uh, people at an arm's length. It avoids contact with anybody he or she thinks to be uh, of lesser or immoral or unsavory. Another kind of righteousness, Jesus' righteousness, moves toward people with forgiveness and understanding and love. What we find out, though, is that Simon the Pharisee not only wants to keep his distance from the woman, he wants to keep his distance from Jesus, even though he's invited him to dinner. In Jesus' attempt to get Simon to a place where he doesn't want to necessarily go, Jesus tells a very simple story about two people who owe debts. One that owes 500 denarii and another that owes 50. And, and the master cancels both the debt when they cannot pay. And then Jesus asks Simon a very simple question with an obvious answer. Now which of them will love him more? Simon knows the answer. <laughs> Clearly the one who owed the most and is forgiven the most is going to love the most. The answer is so obvious that a four-year-old could answer it. But Simon doesn't want to answer it. He doesn't want it answered in the affirmative, so he hedges it with the words, I suppose. I suppose, he says, the, the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And you know how that kind of argument goes. You've been in that place yourself. When somebody puts you in a corner you do not like, when they make an argument logically and get you to a place that you have to agree but you don't want to, you say things like, well, I suppose, or, well, maybe in this particular case, or would you mind if I think about that a little bit? It's an attempt to agree without giving up ground. It's a way of keeping the logic of the argument and the presenter of the argument at a distance. Well, of course, because Jesus is a prophet, he has discerned this about Simon a long time ago that he wanted to keep his distance before he told this parable. He, he had mentioned how when he arrived, Simon didn't extend to him any of the culturally expected, commonly provided niceties. You know how it is when people come to your house. You, you know the 21st century rules and protocols. You open the door, you invite them in, you take their coat, you give them a kiss or a hug if you know them well, you shake their hand, you offer them something to drink. These are just things you do. Well, in the first century, they had their things, but Simon didn't provide any of it. He says to Simon and the woman, you gave me no water for my feet, no welcoming kiss, no anointing oil for my head, but this woman has provided all these things and more. How ironic it is that this woman is more hospitable than the actual host of the meal. The woman clearly has a desire to be close to Jesus, and Simon, he wants to stay far away. And we see this kind of truth played out in our relationships all the time, our entire lives, you know, with our spouses or with our children or our parents or employers or co-workers. It's just possible, folks, to be in the same room and even agree, but be miles away from them. Proximity to Jesus has nothing to do with the distance of feet or inches, but the distance of the heart. Simon is very far away. And he wants it that way. The harlot is very close. And that's what she desires. For me, the thing that creates the, the distance or nearness to Jesus is the perception of one's own need. A person dying of thirst wants ever so, close, ever so much to be close to water. Whereas a person living on Kelly's Island out in Lake Erie doesn't feel the need to be near any more water at all. Simon thought he had no need, and therefore he felt no love. According to his conscience, he's just fine, thank you very much, and so he receives no forgiveness. Simon's impression of himself is like a lot of us in this room. He's a good person in the sight of God and in the presence of people. The woman, on the other hand, she's conscious of nothing else 
but her terrible need. And therefore she's overwhelmed with love for him who can supply grace and forgiveness. Do you see the thing that keeps people away from God? The one thing that shuts a person away off from God is self-sufficiency. If you don't think you need God, you won't have God. Only those who seek find, and only those who knock have the door opened to them. Now, in some ways, what we're looking at today as we hear this story is the, is the story of the prodigal son, just in a different way. I know you folks remember, most of you do, any other story of the prodigal son and his elder brother. In the story of the prodigal son, it's not the fact that the, uh, the younger uh, brother took his father's inheritance and spent it on riotous living, uh, that he's a worse offender than his elder brother who stayed at home and, and followed all the rules. Uh, that, that's not what explains how the younger son can enter more deeply into his father's love. It, rather, it's the fact that the younger son came to himself. That's what the text says. He came to himself in a way that we never know that the elder brother does. This woman, this sinner, this harlot, she's come to herself. She's faced her moral situation in a way that Simon has not done. The significant difference between the woman and Simon is not that she's a worse sinner than he is. In fact, she might not be nearly as bad as him. But she realized more truly and deeply the reality of her sin. It's this deeper understanding of her situation that made it possible for a more intimate relationship with Christ. It's, it's so very hard for respectable people and good people to do this. Pride stands in the way of a greater realization and confession. Simon felt no need, saw no love, and there saw, got no love, received no forgiveness. The woman felt great need, and she receives great forgiveness. According to the Bible, the self-righteous person is in greater danger than the unrighteous person. Now, I'm coming to the home stretch of the sermon, and I hope you know the climax of the story in verse 47. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, note that word, hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. I hope you notice the connection between love and forgiveness. They're inseparable. A person who is forgiven much loves much, and a person who loves much forgives much. If you look at this story as a whole, apparently it is not told or intended to explain why the woman is forgiven, but why she loves. Her acts of devotion and her tears express not so much repentance for forgiveness as love and gratitude afterwards. She has already been forgiven, it's that word hence. Apparently, she had had some earlier encounter with Jesus, felt, uh, felt his presence. She heard the words that she needed to hear earlier at some other encounter, you are forgiven. That's why she comes with a vial of perfume already prepared. She's expressing gratitude for love that Jesus has already released her, has already set her free. And I'm going to put you in a car that's going to take you where you need to go, but maybe where you don't want to go. The truth of the matter is that everybody in this room has a little bit of Pharisee and a little bit of hooker in each one of us. The harlot side, that's easy to see and recognize because all of those sins are visible. Uh, the, the trouble is the sins you can easily identify that you notice, they're not the worst kinds of sins. It's not the sins that you can see that are worse, but the sins that you cannot see. Have, have you not noticed how Jesus treats very differently the two types of sins? I mean, the sins of the flesh are bad, but they're the least bad of all kinds of sin. That's why Jesus seems so incredibly lax and easy when it comes to forgiving sins that are sexual or break the Sabbath rules or there are cer ceremonial sins. Uh, C.S. Lewis, my favorite theologian, though, he says this, all the worst pleasures are purely spiritual. The pleasure of putting other people down or in the wrong. 
of being bossy or patronizing, of being a backbiter or an abuser of power, a person full of hatred or prejudice, one full of self-righteous pride. That's the worst one. (laughs) Those are the worst sins. And that's why Jesus says that the cold, self-righteous person who regularly goes to church may be nearer to hell than the hooker. That's why Jesus said tax collectors and sinners will enter the kingdom of heaven before any of the highly religious people of the world. Sinners recognize their sinfulness. The self-righteous people are blinded by pride. We all have a little prostitute. We all have a little pharisaical side inside of us, but the pharisaical side hides the best. And it is that proud, righteous, judgmental, pharisaical person that really is in need of the greatest forgiveness. Now, as you might imagine, this is not the first time I've wrestled with this text. I have a hard time fitting it into my heart and soul, because after all, I'm one of the religious leaders. I'm one of the self-righteous people that Jesus always had such a tough time with. I'm a good guy, and I know it. You don't have to tell me I'm a good guy, people. You you do it every Sunday, but you need to stop. You don't need to do it, because the devil tells me many times a day, Barry, you're really a good guy. I mean, I know it. I've I've never been drunk. (laughs) Never did drugs. I mean, tried them. (laughs) I've been a faithful husband. I've worked hard in the church. I've tried to be a good husband and father and pastor. And because of this, of course, I am self-righteous and proud and judgmental and arrogant. I wonder how can I take this story into my heart? and not destroy myself. When I was a pastor in Dayton, I had a friend I could always talk to. He kept secrets really good. And I know I could always run into him at a little park across the street from the church, a place called The Phrase. It was right next door to the church. outdoor music venue that had a park surrounding it. And there was always a guy there who took his dog there, walked the dog, sat down on the bench. There he is right there. And I could always go across the street, and I could sit down and talk to that guy. He was very good at listening to me. And so I sat down to him one day, and I said to him, I said, are you going to, the, to watch the dog show next month? He said, you mean the Oscars? I said, no, no, I mean the American Kennel Club dog show. It's going to be on TV in December. I said, they have some really fancy breeds in that show. And he said, well, you give me a mutt any day, the old man said. Those purebreds, they're too high strung for my liking. I said, well, you have a nice dog. What kind of dog is that? The old man said, oh, she's a mutt. Heinz 57, but she's a great dog. I love her and she loves me. I asked the old man, I said, well, where'd you get your dog? He said, I I picked her up on Euthanasia Alley at the dog pound. He said, it's almost like she knew she was sentenced to die. He said, "I, I think that's the good thing about those dogs from the pound. It's like those rescue dogs are really grateful to you. They're so appreciative and they show it. I said, well, what's your dog's name? And you know what he told me? He said, my dog's name is Karis. I said, Karis? What's Karis? Oh, he said, that's a Greek word. It's the word for gift or giver or kindness or gratitude. He said it's the word for grace. I know a black preacher who once said, there are three kinds of people in this world. Them that is, them that ain't, and them that think they is, but ain't. (laughs) This room is filled with all kinds of people, just like me. We have highfalutin purebreds, we have mixed breeds, and we have mutts. And yet all of us, whether we know it or not, we're on Euthanasia Alley. 
And Jesus comes to the pound and he stands in front of your cage and he asks if he can be our master and if we'd like to be free. He says, will you follow me? And the proud, dumb, highfalutin dog doesn't even know that he or she is in a cage. But those who have a real understanding of their situation and life before God, when they hear Jesus' words, they cannot but help wag their tail. Amen.